Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. I'm Todd. <laughs> this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. I'm giggling because I messed up the intro again for the longtime listeners. You'll know I don't normally do that, but I've done it back to back shows now. Or not back to back shows. I, there's a couple of gap between them. <laughs> it depends um, on the shows come out. <laughs> well, I decide when they come out. So I'll make yes, sure it's do. not back to back. You were the master <laughs> of scheduling. Yep. <laughs> uh, as always, it's socially distanced. Uh, we don't know how to do the show and be in the same place. So like if we actually have an episode where Ross and I are in the same space, it'll be the weirdest episode we've ever had. Are we going to like sit on opposite sides of the room with our laptops and our own mics? Yeah. Like, I'm, no, I'm going to be in a separate room. I'm not going to be room? just back. Gonna, to back. <laughs> yeah. We haven't crossed this bridge yet. Hear it through the walls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm still in the Midwest. I'm in Kansas city. If you really want to get specific, I'm on the Kansas side. For those of you that don't understand, that's in two different cities. <laughs> Not even in Kansas City, Kansas. Anyway, uh, Ross is in the Northeast in Connecticut and Todd's in Jersey. Also in the Northeast. Yes. And I well, just uh, had a four-year-old have... sneak up on me and cough. <laughs> <laughs> Four-year-old's like, I don't know what time zones are. <laughs> so Todd, it, again, it is rare that we have two people in the same time zone, let alone within a quick drive or relatively quick drive of each other. So, well, I'm, I'm glad I can make it at least a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> Scheduling is a lot simpler when, uh, when two, well, actually when all three of us have time zones that butt up on each other versus, you know, sometimes it's like two Coast or three in the U S and, and somebody in Australia, which always makes, it's like, Oh, I'm eating, I'm having my breakfast coffee. He's a day ahead minus seven hours. I got yep. Joel. I'm, I yep. know his time yep. zone now. There you go. Uh, there wasn't a lot of news, but the news we're going to talk about is that Backcountry Discovery has released another route. Yes. Uh, it's, it's kind of big. They've been teasing it for a few months now. I think it's been in the works for a couple of years because it's, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into these. But in case you're not familiar with them, the Backcountry Discovery routes, BDRs, are methods they're they're routes and preset plans by which you can basically travel across an entire state almost exclusively or exclusively off tarmac depending on which route which state it is so newest one's been released it's wyoming and it's enormous and it's loading <laughs> it's loading <laughs> chris's screen is like wow i gotta think about all all these places to go it's the it's the biggest backcountry discovery route yet um, these are becoming increasingly popular for uh, overlanders and dirt bikers. And I, I actually do think there is a New Jersey BDR. Let me check on that. Ooh, I know there's new, like they, they call it like um, Northeast. Um, yeah, it, it goes from South Jersey. Let me see if I get this right before I actually pull up the picture. But it goes from South Jersey kind of like New Hampshire and there's only a few sections of pavement that you actually have to do yeah northeast so we do have more than the turnpike <laughs> with a garden state yeah <laughs> I've driven that turnpike <laughs> uh well I was totally wrong so it actually starts in the very northeastern tip of Pennsylvania goes across New York into believe it or not the north tip of Connecticut through Massachusetts up into Vermont and then across New Hampshire into Maine and back into New Hampshire. So I retract what I said about New Jersey. Even though I, I do think there is. it is. is. Yeah, turnpike right. it is. Hey, I mean, you know better than I do. Some parts of the turnpike, turnpike might as well be off-road, but I do think there is a way to get across New Jersey, mostly on dirt. Yeah. For whatever reason, yeah. the scroll is very sensitive. Yes, it is particularly sensitive. So some of those places that that crosses on that map, I've actually off-roaded before. So, so anyway, the Wyoming one it looks amazing. Uh, but you can now connect New Mexico to Colorado to Wyoming for an epic trip. Um, if you so choose. <laughs> yeah, if you have the time. Yes, I have, a, I have a friend who has who has ducked down into New Mexico for a little bit. Um, I did not hover over that, but um, so yeah, they ducked down into New Mexico for a little bit, and then they ran most of Colorado. Um, but yeah, so Wyoming, Northeast California, they they have sections of California. I don't think they've done every section of California yet, 
but then Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Washington, New Mexico, and Arizona. Yep. So I'm very, I'm very excited, especially because like some of the pictures were like, I, I feel like the suburban can do this kind of thing. Like it's, the suburban is very right. not prepped for this yet, but. So keep in mind, these BDRs are really geared towards the like, not entry level enthusiasts because you really do have to be hardcore to do one of these entire things, but they're, they're not meant for extreme vehicle usage. You know, they're not rock crawling. It's not deep mud. It's really for the person who wants to go sightseeing instead of like hardcore off-roading, which is good because it gets more people into the hobby and, you know, some of the scenery, it looks absolutely spectacular. Um, and for the record, the New Jersey one is called the Trans New Jersey Trail. It is 450 miles of dirt roads spanning the state of New Jersey. That makes me, I didn't know New Jersey was that wide or tall. North, south. <laughs> yeah, but like Kansas is like four something east to west. Like, I mean, it takes a, quite a while to go north, south in Jersey, now, especially now is, if you're stuck in Sunday night beach traffic. Right. Well, and I was like, as, as I say, it's east to west, like that's the interstate. Like I'm not traversing dirt roads left and right. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure. So that's probably how we get to 450 miles of New Jersey there. But anyway, yeah. I'm excited about all of the pet country discovery routes mm -hmm. that I haven't done yet. Yep. That um, we will hopefully someday do. Yes. Uh, let's talk about your uh, project is no longer. Yes, it is. Well, it chop is. Chop. No, it's not a chop shop. Let's be clear. It, <laughs> it was at the custom shop in Astoria in Queens. Uh, and it is not a chop shop. It is a very, very, very good facility and they do excellent work. So the Lexus, everything that was to be done on the Lexus is done. And this is a picture of what it looks like now. Um, again, a thank you to all of the parties that have been involved in this uh, custom shop, Ironman 4x4, Toyo, Wheel Pros and Motegi. Um, who am I forgetting? Midland, Midland, Warren, all the, they've all been amazing. Uh, they're, you know, they and I are both very excited for this project and now it's time to hit some dirt. So Monday, going <laughs> off-road Monday. Todd, I told him I needed to test the suburban off-road and he's like, come Monday. And I was like, that's a good, I'm not going to make it. That's a stretch. Like <laughs> start driving now. <laughs> but yeah, it came together great. It drives, you know, I have like extensive conversations with Iron Man about, this specific suspension, the foam cell pro kit and how it will act on road. And it, it drives like 99% like a stock vehicle, which is like compared to the, you know, lifted trucks that I've had experiences with in the past is so refreshing. Um, and yeah, now, now I just have to deal with a few other things that have devolved. <laughs> so the spare tire no longer fits in the spare tire location. And it's uh, it's like 95 pounds worth of tire to throw up into the trunk every time I, you know, need it. And now I just got to figure out what to do. So with developments your, to come. With your giant spare tire. Dude, it, it's not even that big. It's a 285-7017. You know, it's it's a 32.8 inch tire. It's not like it's a 35 or a 37 or something, but. Silly question. And I know you sent me the image today and I don't have this in my brain. Mm -hmm. Is it the same rim on the spare yep. that you have on the other four? Okay. Same wheel, same tire. It's a, it's an identical fifth matching spare. Sweet. And yeah. Ooh, I see it now. Project never, never have to suffer the embarrassment of the steel non-matching <laughs> spare tire. No, I, I've been there. Um, you know, the fifth matching one I've found to be just especially reassuring in off-road situations when you're deep in the woods, just because, you know, in a two wheel drive vehicle or a via or, or something with a selectable transfer case, you can always just throw one of the tires that are bad in the front and then just leave it in two wheel drive and find your way out in two wheel drive, not worry about transfer case or differentials or anything but the Lexus is full-time four-wheel drive. So don't really want to screw with that in any way. So you kind of have a solution. It's a temporary solution. It's, it's not perfect. Where's your back seat? Folded. <laughs> That's yeah. where the spare tire used to go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So um, I, I tried standing it up, but it, the door just won't close. Yeah. Even, you know, even deflated. So, you know, Everything's a project and, and no project is ever really over. 
But I love that I'm giving a hard time about that, but even to get any wheel or tire in the back of a Suburban, I still have to lower the third row seat. Like it's, <laughs> there's a lot of room in the back of a Suburban, yeah. but not quite enough. I've never actually take, like put the third row in the Lexus into its upright position. I might actually just take it out. Like then I get another six or seven inches of depth for cargo. I understand like you get, you'd get more depth of front, but like that third row doesn't go all the way to the back. So like, it would be a weird step down thing. You'd have to almost like make yeah, a, but it's, it's still space platform. Yeah. Yeah. George. That's, that's my news. And the other news is actually extremely timely. Um, the Ram TRX left yesterday <laughs> and was replaced by a 2022 WRX. The new WRX is here and huh. I have it, have it for a week going to spend some time with it. Um, I haven't driven a WRX since I owned my 2017. So it's very, uh, very full circle. And there's a review coming for Everyday Driver, which will go live on March 12th to coincide with the first article I ever wrote for Everyday Driver going live four years ago about my own WRX. So very holistic. It's, it's not orange. It's, it's very, very red. Like I thought the Ram was red. This is like five miles per hour over and I'm getting pulled over for red. <laughs> so. Also, is there a bigger juxtaposition like TRX to WRX size? Like it's in terms mass- of size. <laughs> yeah. Like you went from this truck that is, you couldn't, it was taller than your garage by feet. Yep. yep. And now this will fit in perfect. It will. Yeah. Well, it's currently like half parked on my grass because I have one in two thirds cars worth of driveway. And, you know, I didn't want to park Prescott street. So <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's, I will, I will vouch for him that the red is very bright. It's, it's, uh, it's really bright. Yep. yep. See, so my initial impressions, and I just want to get this out there because I've, I've driven it maybe 10 miles and that's not really grounds for a fair evaluation yet, but everybody went crazy about the cladding, about the fender flares and about the front bumper, you know, and side skirts, and then the, the um, big addition of dark plastic to the rear bumper. In person, like, it looks fine. It's not, you know, everybody who spoke about it or saw it online or like in an auto show said it was the worst thing ever. And it, it looks totally fine. Like, it looks like it's durable instead of just getting, you know, paint that'll be beaten up. So... It's also it's internet culture. If you're not offended, too. what are you supposed to be? <laughs> right. That's, that's absolutely correct. So yeah, very, uh, very much looking forward to putting some miles on it this weekend. Sweet. Um, I jumped away from mine. I, I, I bought things. You did. I did. I think I, did I talk about it in the last show? You talked about the leveling kit. Okay. So leveling kit arrived in the mail um, and then it decided to snow we got somewhere between six and 10 today, but because it drifted, it was like four and 14. Nice. So um, it's going to be a hot minute till I, I get the leveling kit on it. Um, How are I, your tires today? Oh, let's do a shameless plug. <laughs> it's, it's, it's starting to become a shameless plug because we've talked about them quite a bit, but like it's gotten to the point where they, so I, I have Redestein Pinza all terrains on it or ATs. Yeah. Um, they are not an aggressive tire in any way, shape at all. Like they look more, if you just walked up, you'd be like, Oh, you have all seasons on it, but they're reminiscent they, of like a Pirelli Scorpion ATR or something yeah, like that. They have been so kick-ass in the snow. It is, I mean, it probably helps that I'm running 5,800 pounds suburban on top of them. <laughs> To make sure, but like today, like I, I had a doctor's appointment this morning at like eight and they, they were like, oh, there'll be no snow on the ground. You'll be totally fine. And when I started out, I was like, there's a lot of snow on the ground already. Like there, I was, uh, I will say that goddamn front air dam on the front of the truck. Again? Watching still, I was watching snow go blasting out in front of the oh. truck because the air dam was pushing. It was, I was my own snow plow. Um, well, the leveling kit will help. Yeah. The leveling kit will raise it up two and a half inches. And so we'll be good. But, uh, the tires are great. I made my doctor's appointment super easy. I made it home. Uh, then at lunchtime when it was kind of like, kind of nuts with like six to eight inches of snow, I was like, Hey, you know what? I'm gonna go get a sandwich. And so I went out, I was, I'd, I'd been stuck at home with the kids all morning. Like I didn't want to be there. Um, Only person on the road kind of day. No, that that's really, 
I guess it's it's snow country. Yeah, like, hey, we're is. we're snow country, but we're not. And we also have a ton of new people who moved to town who you can definitely tell don't know what they're doing, which is yeah. completely fine. Like uh, you got to learn. It's not about how fast you can go. It's about how you can stop and then main, maintaining momentum and don't get stuck in soft spots. Like that's about it. Um, but the suburban was great. I, I I think I joked last week about like it's effectively becoming like a tank, like tankish, like. The only thing I think that will defeat it is ice. And this storm was supposed to begin with ice and transition to snow, but it was so packed when I went out. Like I didn't really have any issues with like slipping and sliding stuff. Nothing wins against ice anyways. Yeah, I did watch a, a, a salt truck like get down through the snow just to the pavement. And I was like, I, is he going to go? I don't, I don't know if he's going to go. Oh, oh, okay. He's got it. Like uh, he was just trying to get down a neighborhood street. So the other thing I did was I bought some LED backup lights um, for the Suburban just because it had little incandescent lights and they were nice, but I was and having a hard small time. children that like to yeah. run around in, in blind spots. Constantly sometimes. Um, so I did actually, I'm going to do the faux pas. I'm going to put my license plate out. Ooh. Ooh, well, um, no. Now it doesn't help that like this is daylight when I took this photo and then um oh my god it was so dumb i gotta i so these are what the stock lights look like as you can eventually i have to change the license plates lights now because they don't match um but have fun with those yeah those are a little more difficult i did not get very far installing the lights because i went to put it in and of, of course it was one of those things where it's an led light you reverse the polarity and then I was like, oh, crap, it didn't turn on. Like, oh, I need to get it out. I'll switch the polarity. And as, as I'm getting out, it just came out of the the, so the socket. Yeah, the light fixture socket thing yep. came yep. out and went directly into the tail light housing. And I was like, oh, F. So my, my fingers kid, aren't that small. No, they're not. And uh, my, my kid had a sports meeting that I had to take him to. So, like, I got the old light in. So, like, this road with me across town and back just nice. hanging out back there. As um, got back from his meeting and I was like, all right, let's actually like, first of all, stop by O'Reilly's. Let's get a magnet because I didn't have a magnet yet. Um, and this is, please don't judge the clutter in my garage. We're doing some remodeling as well. Um, it started to rain last night. So left side is the stock incandescent, <laughs> uh, bulb and the right side is the led one noticeably brighter, noticeably um, brighter. And so I did get the right one installed before I backed out for the sports meeting. And I could definitely like on the rear view camera, I could definitely tell the side that had the new bowl. Mm -hmm. Like it was definitely uh, brighter on that side. So I very happy with my purchase. Um, I spy a, a pink Barbie Jeep that needs a five horsepower brings a Stratton engine. Uh, it is not Barbie. It is just a Jeep. And it's, it's actually, just a Jeep. Oh. It's just, it's going away soon. It does have a uh, light up wheels that have leds in them and has oh, really? a functioning light bar above the windshield and headlights that light up and taillights that light where up. where is it going away to anybody want to buy it i will sell it to you um homie it is there's no way you're shipping that and we saw you don't have a lot of room in the back of the lexus and i don't think you're paying for that gas. <laughs> just drive it out here <laughs> that's so far away oh my god uh, just hang, hang on to it for like a year no it takes up so much <laughs> space so <laughs> Uh, I did take a little a little hero shot of the suburban this morning after I it got you were me say of, the, of the power wheels. <laughs> no, at that pink Jeep, it's gone. Um, uh, I do like it though. Like it's a good. We're completely off topic with the power wheel Jeep. Way right now. off. Way off. Um, but that one is. I want to say it's like Moderna, Moderna, or a company similar name to that. It's not like Perprego or the other power wheels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's right. I know multiple power wheel company names. What's <laughs> up? Power wheels like Kleenex, by the way. I just uh, want to point that out there. Like not yeah. all power wheels are mm -hmm. power wheels. Anyway. Um, but the the way the electric motor on that pink cheek goes, like it it slowly builds. It's not instant torque like we're used to. And so because it slowly builds, it it's actually like great for the little, little one. Small like three, children. Yeah, the three and a half year old's great with it. Oh so. my God. We've done how many shows now? And this is like the first time that Power Wheels has come up. That's actually kind of amazing. Well, we, you couldn't see the camouflage Polaris Power Wheels sitting next to it, mainly no. because it's camouflaged. Uh, <laughs> but that's the one we'll keep because that's the one that fits the seven year old and the three and a half year old. So, um, and the only other thing I'm doing is I'm browsing mountain bikes because my two oldest boys 
are into mountain biking now. They both got mountain bikes for a uh, birthday and Christmas stuff. And they're like, Hey dad, we want to go ride. And all I have is like street bike giant with like an inch oh, yeah. of a tire. Um, so part of me wants to take them out with that and just see like, if I can get hurt, like you'll get hurt. Well, I, if I can hang with them, like I'll put a helmet on, but like, um, I used to mountain bike a lot more when I was younger. So like, but like, even just looking at options now, it's just like, holy crap. Can I not have a hobby that isn't crazy expensive? Like what's a cheap hobby? Like, uh, I don't think they exist. Swimming. If you live at the beach. Okay. That seems expensive. Yeah. I say, don't you have to yeah. live at the beach then? Like that's living not... at the beach. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. I, I retract that statement. You know far away at beaches for me. <laughs> no running is cheap because there is a physical toll. I got nothing. But yeah, I got nothing. Low... Yeah. Was that Todd? He said, nothing. I said, I got nothing. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. even, you know, anything that you think of that's, that's a hobby. There's a system designed to extract the most money possible from you, regardless of what that hobby is. That's that's where my day job exists is in marketing. Dude. So I'm trying to separate you from your dollars. <laughs> I don't know, man. Ten years ago, I was thinking about buying a new mountain bike mountain and bike. should have. And I was like, I could spend 500 bucks, get a great mountain bike. Now a good bike that's like affordable is 1500 bucks without blinking. I, I will say like, you're not off on the $500 range. Like you need it. Still. You need it. You need to talk to our editor at Hoonerverse, Jeff. He will steer you in the right way. Sure. Uh, he sent me some awesome oh, options. The problem was they were all in California, and I would have to then ship them here. And so right. then that five hundred dollar bike became like a three hundred dollar or seven hundred dollar bike or eight hundred dollar bike. Uh, I'll I'll probably find something closer and cheaper. But that's the yep. end of my updates. Yep. Um, we yeah, because you know you saw in that garage I had space for another bike, right? <laughs> hanging from the ceiling there are two up there already <laughs> nice <laughs> so todd so todd yes where do you where do you want to give us a quick elevator pitch introduction so i am the product public relations manager for subaru i've just actually been doing that for uh, almost a year at this point uh so you know Working uh, with media, talking about uh, all of our wonderful products, uh, past, present, and maybe a little bit future, but not very far into the future. <laughs> the uh, things you can talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, prior to that, I, I worked in uh, product planning. So okay. doing product okay. planning for pretty much anything that we make at one point or another. At Subaru? So, like you can yes. moved over. Oh, okay. How long have you been with Subaru? Since 2004. Holy crap. Okay. All right. So, so you've okay. seen uh, <laughs> the explosion of Subaru. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I was there, I got a, uh, you know, a company car. The first company car that I got was a 2003 yellow Baja. Nice. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Turbo and manual, manual non-turbo. Um, but then the, the second one, and this was, this was fun um, because nobody wanted it because it didn't have a radio. It was an 04 STI. Oh and it, the, those cars back then, the radio was optional. Yeah. So crazy. To think you know, like that. nobody wants this. There that doesn't have a radio. It's like, in, take it, give it to me. That's a great company <laughs> car. Yeah, it was the best company car, I think, ever. What color the was gold, the STI? Gold wheels. It was blue with the gold wheels. Oh, and uh, what was 04? Was, was that? Was that was the that first a, year. First year of the, was it a bug eye or a hawk eye? At that point. So it was the interim. Uh, I think they called it the blob eye is what blob. the blob eye. Yes. It's the kind that I want, Ross. I see. Yeah, that's that's like the the STI. Um, so I learned to drive manual transmission on a 2005 Legacy GT. Wagon. Thank you, Doug. So uh, Subaru has kind of been in my blood. <laughs> D After. Doug, of course, drove one. And so we have a Thanks, picture Doug. with Doug in a blue S. Is that on our triple eights? Oh my God. That it is might be. so much tire <laughs> for that car. Um, okay. So you've been with Saru since 04. Um, what made you move over? Was it just you like change positions? Was it looking for something different, like trying to get, see a different side of things or? Yeah. I mean, I, I had done the, the, uh, the, the planning 
thing for about nine years. So it was, it was time to do something uh, different. And I really love Subaru. I like working at, at Subaru. And I, over the years, I've done a lot of different things with the PR staff and I really like working with them. So, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a natural thing for me where it's like, I, you know, a lot of experience, even before the, the product planning with, with Subaru and with, with engineering and with, you know, the, the auto industry. And then I like working with those guys. It just was a, it was a good place to go. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I moved over. Were you into cars before starting your career with Subaru? Uh, oh yeah. From <laughs> <Okay>. like, <laughs> yeah, I think my first word was probably car. Good. <laughs> That's great to hear. We, we, we're, we're, uh, much approval there. So what's in your own personal garage at this point? Uh, okay. Uh, so I have a, a five speed Impreza hatchback that, that I drive like the daily kind of car. Uh, and then recent one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 2021 and then a, uh, uh, 06 WRX wagon, uh, Excellent. that we have to kind of do the practical thing faster. Mm-hmm. Um, homie, that is a car I want. They're so it's, good. They're so good. It's, it's so, so much fun. My best friend had a Saab 92X Aero, which was a, an 06 or 07 WRX wagon, and it had an STI swap, and it was just so rowdy. But yeah, it's the perfect size car. You know, it can do everything, and it's just not huge and enormous. What color is your wagon? It's uh, WR Blue. WR. As it should be. Okay, so you have that. And is it stock or is it, have you like gone down the rabbit hole? So we, we got it and it was stock and we, we paid through the nose to find like a clean, low mileage Hawkeye wagon. And then after we got it, it's like, uh, what's that? Did you find it in the Northeast? So we, we did, uh, actually it was up in, in Connecticut, but, um, you know, working for the car company, we were able to kind of figure out where it had been, mm-hmm. you know, because people yeah. have it serviced at, at dealers and stuff. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. the car was not a Connecticut car. The car had actually come from, you know, the, you know, the lower middle part of the country somewhere. And it had only just gone to Connecticut. So it was actually, it's, it's, it's very clean underneath. It was really nice. So we got it. And then, you know, it's like, well, we should make it a little bit louder. And then so... <laughs> <laughs> evolved a little bit but uh it's 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 not super crazy modified okay. so, good. so what else you sound like there's more uh yeah uh <laughs> there's more um so as i progress down the 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 into the stupidity um and I, i'll say none of these are really off-road vehicles so that's um, fine okay, dude we're all um, about anything automotive here you had but, wrx wagon we're good like we've checked the box <laughs> Okay. Um, so the next, the next one, I have, uh, an, a Lotus Elise. Oh. Excellent. Okay. Um, and the Austin mini. Yes. All right. So you've what your mini? touched every corner. Uh, the mini is an 80. That's awesome. Is it? So, what engine is in it right now? Is it so it's like, it's a one liter, so it's like the middle engine. It's not yeah. the uh the super fast uh mm-hmm. one, but it, it's it's fast enough to keep up with traffic. <laughs> so which is all you need for something that weighs that much and is that size. Um yeah, it's 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 thirteen hundred and some pounds, thirteen fifty, something like uh, that. Would like to let the record show that is less than a player's razor right now. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> So how long have you had the Elise and is it modified? Have you like track prepped it or, or track? I it have had it almost 12 years at this point. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. So you got in when they were like technically 12 years, what years, 12 years ago, they were still sold in U S in 2010. Yeah. yeah. It was still, uh, still under the warranty. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought it secondhand from a guy. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, 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 I do. Uh, I, it's, it's, I don't drive it very much, but it's, uh, I, I do enjoy driving it. It's mm-hmm. just, it's, uh, you know, I take the top off in the, 
in like March, and then it just it, it never comes out with a top on it. Perfect. Yeah, Todd, who I write for at Everyday Driver, has one. You know, it, it's like it's the pinnacle of sports car. There's nowhere really to go in terms of actual involvement from there until you, unless you just jump to like Caterham, you know, <laughs> but that's really slippery slope. You can jump into a Caterham. <laughs> you have to jump into a Caterham. <laughs> There's no other way. Uh, me, me being the, the Subaru guy, I will say that the BRZ is uh, also an amazing, you know, car to drive as that type of, smaller lightweight car i mean it is it is a bit heavier but it's really stress-free uh yes <laughs> in right. comparison right. to something that's like a giant potato chip uh, <laughs> no it's gonna break modern crumple zones <laughs> yeah you know but then, no the, the the brz i've uh driven them a bunch and and i love them to death they're just uh they're just you know the, especially the new one uh you yes. know it's uh you know it just does everything incredibly, incredibly well. And it's, it's easy to live with. It's a car you can drive every day and pretty much do anything you want, you know, performance so, wise, except maybe go off road. Um, uh, hom- you know, hey man, homie, I've- the, the prior gen, some people have done like one and a half inch lifts on the prior gen on mud flaps and like snow tires and it's a rally car, you know? So off road is just what you make of it. Yeah. Uh, but Chris has spent some time. You drove the current BRZ. Yes, it is amazing. I got I got hot laps on Road America in it. So I and I and I hopped from that to like the I was in a BRZ. I was in uh, one of the one of the Supras. I don't remember what I think it was the bigger engine, and then a Lexus. And I try to fit myself into the Miata as well to try and get a, a comparison. And at six foot four with a helmet on. I literally don't fit in the Miata. So, uh, but I fit comfortably in the BRZ. You fit fine in the BRZ. Yeah, I, that was a piece of cake. I still had a little bit of headroom. And I, it was the first one I drove on Road America without having ever driven Road America. And so my first lap around, I was making sure I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to do <laughs> and also fit in the car for everyone else that day. But no, by the, I think I went out like three or four times in it and I, I had a blast. Like it was, you can have both windows down because you're on a track and that's what you're supposed to do on the track. And there's not insane buffeting of the air at hundred mile an hour plus like the Supra. Mm-hmm. Once you have the windows window down, down, like you have to go window down on Road America. Yes. Though at least the people that we were there with were like, put your windows down. I'm like, yeah, I don't understand that. So one um, less thing to crack or break up. And if a journalist puts it in the fence at yeah. 80 or 90, and the group we were there with, that wasn't that big of an issue. Yeah, it was not that. Everybody I was with was an automotive journalist, at least. Like, yeah. everyone had car experience. Um, Todd, can you speak to, like, the development cycle of this BRZ at all? Because it was it was probably only, like, three years ago that there was a flutter of, like, questions about, is the BRZ going to get another generation? You know, or is this a one-and-done you know, magical story of a partnership is, was there anything that, you know, stuck out to you in terms of this happening or is there anything you can talk about on that front? Uh, No, I mean, it was, you know, the, the automotive development cycle is, is really long. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a lot longer than people think of, you know, Mm -hmm. especially when you, when you get to the part where when you, when you first start, there's a long period of time where you're planning uh, what you're going to do, because when you come out with a car, you, you're coming out with a car, you know, a few years into the future and you need to predict where the market's going, mm-hmm. you know, not necessarily what you want to, you know, just make with that car, but what's the market going to be like? So, you know, you need to change it in, in certain ways. And so, you know, with BRZ, um, you know, was developed in a partnership with, with Toyota. And, and I think because of that partnership, maybe things were a little bit kind of kept close to the vest. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it, was, it, was, yeah. it wasn't a last minute thing where it was kind of like, oh, gosh, two years ago, let, let's get this going. Uh, you know, it was an mm. ongoing, it's been an ongoing project since kind of the first, you know, first car began development really, really a long time ago. Um, you know, and there's obviously once you start with the current 
or the sorry the new generation there's time before you start doing the the, the planning for the next one but it's it's uh it wasn't kind of a last last minute thing i know that there were maybe some some people that were surprised that we <laughs> did come out with another generation of the car but I, I think for us both brands really liked the car liked having it in the lineup liked mm-hmm. what it did for for them and the enthusiasts that bought it really enjoyed them they were you know a profitable car to make for for both of the brands and you know it, so i, I I think in terms of both brands, we didn't go into the first generation car with the expectation that it was going to be like a Corolla or a Camry and sell enormous volume. I think, uh, you know, we were, we were happy with the volume that the car did the first time around or we wouldn't have made the the second generation. Yeah. I mean, to touch on two points, I I do think there is some kind of aspect to the automotive media where they, they start bringing up questions like that to get information out of the automakers. So, you know, whereas you and Subaru and Toyota were probably talking about this in like 2015, um, (laughs) it was hush hush and and everybody was kind of going, well, it's been out for five or six years. So is something going to happen? And and by bringing out that question, it, it tries to prod people like you into spilling the beans. (laughs) um what's the 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 old adage is that i can't speculate on future products i can't speculate yeah. on i'm just here so i don't get fined yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is that's it, it kind of when I, I like that you're talking about like looking ahead because i also feel like the brz is great it's it's a great little sports car it's it it definitely has its own niche um but the wilderness lineup for whoever saw that two three five years ago and was like that's where we need to go it's fantastic yeah actually the when i was in planning and uh me and and some of the guys there we were we were part of the group that really were were pushing for that idea that concept you know because you know part of it is we just saw our our owners uh, what they were doing with the cars and and they were taking them further off road and they were telling us like, Hey, you know, we like what you make, but we want kind of, we want more of it. We want more (laughs) capability and, and more, you know, more adventure readiness kind of built into these products. And we started kind of looking around and, 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 you know, watching what these guys were doing and, and, you know, for the whole wilderness thing for us is what we found was our, owners were a little bit different than some of the other brands uh like like for example jeep uh you know people would buy a wrangler for the purpose of off-roading right you know they they want to go off-road they want to climb over boulders and rocks and yeah. things and they'll make incredible compromises in the car that they <laughs> they have yes. to be able yeah. to climb yeah, over that thing yeah and and what we we found with the 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 Subaru guys was they said, you know, they weren't into off-roading as, as the activity. They wanted a car that was going to get them mm-hmm. to the activity that they wanted to do, to do right. the biking or the kayaking or the overlanding. They wanted a car oh, to get days. them there yeah. without, you know, maybe without the, the, the complexity. They just wanted to go and, right. and they to want do those things. It to be the means to their end, but, you know, so no- there's not break in getting there you know you know disconnectable sway bars and and all that uh you know stuff which is really super cool stuff but 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 you know our our buyers are you know the 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 wilderness you know guys you know when i say guys it's in the general sense which is kind of (laughs) they want to to, to be uh something that is is a daily car you drive it every day you still have the expectation that it's going to be comfortable and safe but hey we really want it to do these things so mm-hmm. we just started trying to figure out okay what can we do to to be better at those things without you know completely destroying what the baseline car is and so, so you get it to well we get as much ground clearance as we can uh you know put some more aggressive tires work on the approach and departure angles and, and the gearing but then we, we started getting into the other piece where, you know, let's make the interior durable, you know, yes. so we have a water resistant fabric and all weather floor mats and the cargo areas all, you know, everything in the interior is, is easy to clean. 
Uh, but it's it's nice stuff. It you know it's not something that that feels you know cheap or plasticky. It's it's all got a nice feel to it. But it's all easy to clean. And then we took the crossbars. Uh, you know, on the Outback, yep. they have kind of a, a folding crossbar that's really versatile. It's just awesome. You know, the fact that you can just unclip them and swing them to the side for yeah. less wind noise and for better gas mileage. And really, they're 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 super brilliant. convenient. Uh, but they they couldn't hold a lot of weight. You know, so there was kind of a price for the convenience, you know, so we went back to the kind of basic ladder type crossbars for the wilderness and, you know, they can hold, uh, I think it's 700 pounds, you know, statically. So you can put a, you can put a roof tent up on the car or, you know, a big basket with heavy stuff in it, uh, you know. Spare tire well, and gas cans and all the you know your 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 dynamic load limit is, is lower, but it's still pretty pretty substantial, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, for that type of car. So we really just kind of went into the overall e- use case and 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 kind of tailored the vehicle for those uh, for those buyers, and it, they've been really well received for us, both the Outback and the the Forester. Yep. I think we're we're about. In the last few months, about twenty percent of the sales mix is wilderness, what? which is really hot. That I mean, that is fantastic. You go like that's a huge percentage, and so they, and it's also a, a good canvas for the guys that that really want to want to go even further. It's it's a it's a great starting point, you know, even to go down that path. That you've got a lot of stuff already on the car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I had I had seat time in one, and I. I had it on an off-road co- course with a 392 Wrangler. I didn't get the 4 by e Wrangler, uh, but and I, I drove a Bronco. Um, I did not drive the TRX. I drove a Raptor. I drove a Bronco. Oh, different course. Different course. No, same course, but I didn't drive it. Um, oh, I thought you. I'd like no, you I didn't drive the uh... TRX. I was like, that's not going to fit. I'm not dealing with that. Um, <laughs> but the, by the time I got to the the Subaru Outback Wilderness, like somebody else had already been a little too robust in some off-road things that they shouldn't have done. And so um, I didn't get to do some of the obstacles that I a hundred percent know myself and that car could have done. And I was, re- I was a little frustrated because I didn't get to say like, it did everything that every other off-road vehicle did there, but because I didn't want to, again, continue to damage the car mm-hmm. for other people. Somebody drove too fast through the whoops and pops some front fascia off. It wasn't, the car continued to function completely. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is that in the wilderness, X mode stays on at higher speeds. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, uh, that was the thing when we, when we were, one of the things we did very early on in that, you know, that development is because a lot of us, we weren't really off-road guys. So we said, you know, let's, let's take these these standard cars off-road and we got some kind of uh, I guess I'll call them crushers, cr- prototype cars or whatever that we're going to be ultimately destroyed. And we just took them off roading where you, you don't have to really be terrified that you're going to permanently <laughs> damage it. And we just pushed them to see, you know, how far you can go. And we were all genuinely surprised at how capable the standard models were when we really, really pushed them. Uh, but then we, we took back and said, well, these do the things we can we can we can improve and do better and we, we did that on the wilderness but it was uh it was really interesting to uh to to take them you know as far as they'll go it leads to the old adage that the best off-roader is the one you care about the least or the one you have <laughs> and that's i think how some people with standard pre-wilderness outbacks found out that these things can actually like go places for lack of a better phrase um backing up todd so when you were looking at helping or, or being a part of the creation of the wilderness line, what led to that? Was there, so like, this is going to be some inside baseball stuff because Chris and I both work in marketing and like, it's, you know, <laughs> a lot of the auto industry is kind of trying to prod into the brain of the people who make the stuff that we actually want to and get to drive. So did you tap into existing Outback owners, aspirational Outback owners? What was the methodology? If you can, you know, speak to how wilderness came to be. Was it like talking to Jeep people and asking what they wanted to see in in Outbacks? How'd you create this? So, you know, it's uh, when when you're in that space, you're really looking uh, for pretty much any piece of data that you can get from anywhere. (laughs) 
you know, mm-hmm. be it uh, syndicated research studies, which if you're in OE, you can get a lot of different research studies uh, about a lot of different things. And you can kind of cut through that and slice through that. And, you know, you can say, well, you know, here's three cars in a given segment and, and you can see the, the owner profiles in terms of even hobbies and interests and, and you know, what makes you, you unique uh, and what makes you not unique, uh, you know, all that. And, and you're doing that. And then you're also kind of looking at the, the, the bigger trends, you know, there, you know, people are maybe going out doors more they're being more active especially in the last few years um but you, you kind of watch the trends there and and see what's happening and then with with uh subaru we are uh, i guess blessed with owners who are really passionate in mm-hmm. in in a broad sense and they're really very happy to tell us what they want <laughs> so you know we we really we take a lot of pride in, in listening to our, our customers, but it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's not just the enthusiasts on the forums. You know, I, I think it goes back to, you know, back a, a long ways where, you know, we're a smaller brand, you know, mm-hmm. our sales, you know, recently are, are much higher, but going back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, the sales were much, much smaller. We don't have a dealership, you know, on every corner. So it was kind of like if you if you ended up buying a Subaru it was often because you did your research and you did a lot of research and analysis and, and you were looking into what kind of car and then you found Subaru and it does these things for you and, and you know, safety and reliability and all wheel drive. And you, you go and you end up and you you, you find a Subaru because you, you researched it, not because you're like, well, I'm going to buy a car today. Uh, I'm going to stop <laughs> by the place on the way home from work and pick it up. Yeah, it's not it's not you what's know. the biggest thing on my way home so uh, so you end up where it's not just the the enthusiast the, the the average buyer is is really highly informed with with what they have and and how it works and, and it, it, it's really kind of surprising to me uh you know that uh you know there's that level of 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 awareness do you feel like you're working to bring to market cars for people like yourself has that ever kind of crossed your mind? You know, there, there were a lot of, uh, you know, different things that I worked on. And, and I was always, you know, in that mindset of, you know, you can't let your personal, uh, you know, your personal opinion sway. You know, you're not making a car for you. You're making a car for, you know, a, a buyer and into the, the market. But that being said, you also, you do want the stuff that you work on to, to be, you know, a thing that you like that you would buy, right? You right, would right. always try to make it that way. And, and when we did some of the uh, maybe smaller things like the, the special edition, like the WRXs and, and BRZs and stuff. Like the ones, the color of my wall, the pumpkins. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of those were, 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 you had a little freedom to say, you know what, the, you know, we want to make this, you know, you know, the, the way that I, I think people like me who, who would buy this car would, would want it to be. I mean, it's nice to have car people doing that kind of stuff, you know, versus if it was just the trope of like bean counters and A to B's, we would be in a totally different place. Um, and, that, you know, I, I think we're seeing that in some capacity, but there's also a reason that cars like the uh the new toyota subaru pairings whether it's the brz or the um oh god forgive my dyslexia no not not that the the one that i'm totally having a dyslexic moment over the solterra and the oh whatever they're calling it but you know they, they seem exciting and they seem like they're different and not just like cookie cutter. Um, have you had any time or any uh, involvement in these, in the new electric cars, the development of that and where things are going there? So, so I, I from a development standpoint, uh, no, uh, you know, that, uh, that was an area that I, I, I didn't, uh, 
I didn't really get into before uh, moving out of the the planning side. Um, that being said, you know, had a chance to to drive some of them and and experience them and you know get a get a feel for what they're for what they're like, but but not being a part of the development. Do you foresee that that kind of mentality and, and platform having a, a wilderness future? Will there be some kind of off roadified Solterra, Solterra wilderness? So I, you know, I, <laughs> can't really I can't say. talk about that. <laughs> but, you know, that, that being said, uh, you know, the wilderness uh, really has done well with us. You know, we, we're, we're, we're doing good sales volume with them, but the, the people who are buying them are really enthusiastic about them. Like we see a lot of people, you know, posting these things on social media and, and they're just, it's, it's, it's a very exciting car for, for, for a lot of people. And, and I think that, you know, that's, that's something that we'll, we'll do more with in, in the future. I, I think we'll, we're not done with the out, out, outback and the Forester. Okay. But, uh, not ready to talk about what comes next, but I think it, no allusions to like a uh, cross track wilderness or my hopes and dreams of a BRZ wilderness. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, my my favorite story about cross track is everyone's like, when is it getting a turbo? And the last Subaru rep I talked to was like, probably never because you guys you guys sell everyone you make already. So. Yeah, seriously, it's not like needs help. <laughs> we probably don't see a wilderness cross track for a while either because again, they're selling them all. <laughs> It's a good problem to have. If an STI Crosstrek is ever made, I will put down a deposit upon <laughs> release. Let the they won't. Show. They won't, but I just want to put that out there. Um, so where do we want to go? I mean, you know, it's, I'm sure, tricky for you to talk future product um, past what is really publicly available. Uh, but I, I have a, a really, really, really bright red WRX like 10 feet from me. So I have to ask about STI. Uh, what, uh, what can <laughs> you tell us? I know there's probably not much, but I, I just have to ask. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the uh, best I, yeah, I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not ready to talk about that one yet. I had a can feeling. you tell us about time frame? how like when we should or can expect some kind of news i would probably disappear <laughs> off the earth uh, <laughs> uh, yeah uh, todd, todd said that the first specs were going to leak on like you know i don't know april 2nd that's my birthday weird and uh and also he there's an episode of the pine barrens uh, you know, the sopranos that happens in the pine barrens it's not too far from his house that uh <laughs> Trying to get someone eliminated? Um, what are you doing? Yeah. He's a guest. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would probably get out like three words and, and the signal would be cut and that would be the last <laughs> you'd see of me. Oh, that's... Uh, man, uh, that's funny. That's funny. Do, now, now I'm worried about who's listening. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, oh God. I mean, there's so much future stuff that we could talk about well, this year. Real, so, real fast about wilderness though. Um, Todd, has there been any, because you guys have Outback Wilderness, Forest or Wilderness out already, and I'm, I'm assuming there will be more offerings coming just because it makes so much sense um, kind of in the marketplace. Have, have you guys run into any, uh, your current position is very, I would say very firm with those two. Any, any other surge with like Mazda cutting in with the CX-50? Have you, have you seen any, uh, God, what else has been out that's off-roady themed? I think you can see uh, where I'm going with my question. TRD adventure. Yeah, like, like you know, I, I, I was just trying to think for for the last couple of years have been so, uh, I guess, unique because of the the pandemic and then everything following with supply chain and everything. You know, we we've, we've been in a situation for a while where we, you know, we 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 could sell more if we had them. You know, we we just. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we're building as many as we can and it's, it's not enough. So it's, you know, and, and I'm not in a space where anymore, where I can, I, I have access to that kind of that oh, deep that data, data, but it, you know, it, it's, uh, 
I've not seen anything where a, a competitor has come and kind of uh, come in and kind of etched sales away, you know, because if you go back, you know, pre pandemic, you know, five years ago, if you had a car and a competitor came in and started etching away, you'd know it because your sales were mm -hmm. declining and you would be able to see, oh gosh, they're going to, to some other model, but that's, you know, not something that's been happening lately. It's a completely different scenario. All right, bro. Sorry. I got one more off topic with, yeah, with, it. uh, you guys are, are like one of the few companies that still make cars. Like you have the Ascent yeah. now and you, and you have the Forester, but like you still make actual there's cars. There's a like, <laughs> yeah, there's a legacy, real actual cars while we watch Ford pull the plug on all of their actual cars. Yeah, no, I, I, I will say I actually was on the uh, looking at their website for something the other day. And I, I just uh, I looked at the top and you have the little section where it's like you can click and it's like, you know, trucks and then SUVs and then performance and then, you know, commercial. They have all the little tabs for everything. And you just click on cars and it just hit Mustang. It was just so strange. Like, that's really weird. That's the world we live in today. That's why it's so great that there is a new BRZ, you know, and that they, you can walk into a dealer and buy a WRX or an STI or an Outback or a, a legacy and not just walk into the dealership and be, you know, bludgeoned to death with. These are our seven to 10 different crossovers, <laughs> you know, which might be where the money is, but it's also interesting that we're seeing other manufacturers i've literally heard people refer to it as like outbackifying you know or like making their like porsche's doing the tycon cross turismo and people are calling it like the tycon outback you know like the stamp is there so it's not going anywhere um yeah, I, I think one thing that's helped us is that, uh, you know, we, we, we have the cars, that, but the cars that we make are kind of unique in, in the marketplace, you know, with the, the standard uh, symmetrical all wheel drive. And, and we do make you make cars that that I guess, in addition to being really safe and reliable, we you know have roof rack brackets and we have a lot of little different pieces where they're, they're pretty usable and pretty versatile. Just the door openings are really wide. The trunk openings are really wide and. They're just really easy, uh, kind of, I don't know, say easy to live with, and, and maybe more versatile than a lot of the other sedans, which is, is is kind of helps helps them, you know, in in that niche that they're in. I'm I'm giggling um, because my my oldest is is approaching driving years, and he was like, "I'm getting a Wrangler, right?" And I was FRS. like, "FRS." No, he's FRS. not getting an FRS. Uh, he's probably getting a Forester. <laughs> for Forester, a there you go. Like Manual it's... Forester. You can't look at his phone if he's shifting gears. Uh, exactly. Like, and again, like it's all-wheel drive. It's safe. Like it's fairly reliable. So I mean, let's. I do want to back up a little bit and, and talk about one thing. So when the BRZ launched, and to this day, I think there is still still some aspect of people who look at it and go, oh, it's a BRZ. It's got symmetrical all-wheel drive. It's a Subaru. Is, has that subsided at all? Or do people still assume that just because it's, you know, it has the Subaru badge on it, it's an all-wheel drive car? Like there's definitely been stories of people who walked out of the dealership and, and were like, wait, crap, this is rear-wheel drive, which is, you know, a good thing. Is that, has that? And I think early on, there might have been some confusion there, but mm -hmm. I, I think from for a long, long, long time, most of the buyers who are buying a BRZ or, or an 86 aren't people who were in the showroom and say, hey, that looks cool. They, they know what they're buying. <laughs> they know what they're getting. They're, they're, they're into that type of car and that type of experience. I, I don't, I haven't heard any, you know, misinformation with that regard or any stories where it, somebody was surprised that the, you know <laughs> okay it was it didn't have power on all four wheels or anything well, was an all-wheel drive brz ever considered no uh, <laughs> because, you know the, the the whole premise for that project was you know we we wanted to take the we wanted to keep the boxer engine 
and mm-hmm. and really do uh, do something to really showcase all of. Uh, from a performance standpoint, you end up with more weight higher up and then up over the nose. So when, when you get into something like the BRZ sports car, you want all the weight close to the middle. You want it really far down. And so by, by adopting the rear wheel drive architecture, they were able to move the engine. I, I think it was like five inches. Uh, it was like five inches lower and much further back. Oh, wow. You know, That's just a- there's no... I mean, if you ever open the hood and look at the, where the engine is in a BRZ, you, there's no way to put axles go into the front wheels, right. you know. And if if you tried to do that, you would end up with you would end up with a WRX coupe. Right. You would end up with a totally different car than than what it is. Right. Which I mean, I'm sure some people would be thrilled about, but that's not really. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, the original the idea was to, to 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 showcase the boxer engine in in that you know what what can it what else can it do you know and and you really you have to put it there to do that right i mean it's pretty amazing because dynamically speaking on a on strictly on a de- driving dynamics perspective it's the best driving car you can get short of a porsche is a brz or a miata and what does the BRZ share in common with a Porsche? It is that the engine does what my, I just tried to do with my hands and, and can't do, you know. It's it, flat. It's flat. It's a flat design <laughs> and, and it, the engine, you know, the pistons are opposed opposite of each other and it's keeping the center of gravity low, keeping the weight low, keeping everything compact and allows for better driving dynamics. So you know, it, it really did showcase that. And I mean, there's huge fanfare for a reason. I think if I was speaking on behalf of the audience, the audience would want to know if there's a Baja replacement coming, which really pushes on the future product stuff. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I guess that's, uh, you know, that's another, another one. I can't really comment about the, the future stuff. <laughs> I I know we we have the you know the 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 Baja you know we we sold them for a few years we didn't we didn't actually sell that many of them. It was oh uh, four to oh seven oh oh three was the first 03. year oh wow and then I think oh seven I think was that was the last year hmm. and um, you know so we, we we didn't do a huge number of them but the people who bought them love them to death they are extremely dedicated and you know e- the day that they went out of production it, they you, they've just been impossible to find you know secondhand you know they're just they're really hard to find i was just there was one on bring a trailer uh i guess a couple days ago mm-hmm. somebody had a o i think it was an o four o five it was a, not a turbo. It was just a blue manual Baja with blue. very, very low miles. And I, I think it closed out at like $41,000. That's right. Holy shit. $41,000? <laughs> I mean, and it was probably what, like 25 or 26 new? Uh, probably in that range, yeah. Oh, my God. That's a huge number. I mean, that was like – I mean, Subaru – is doing amazing things now, has done amazing things over the last, you know, decade. But if you think about the fact that at, at, in 04 to 06, there was the Baja, which you get with a turbo and a manual. There was a Forester XT, which you get with turbo and a manual. And there was the STI and the WRX wagon, all concurrent. Like that was a special, special time in cars. Yep. I I actually, uh, in 2005, uh, every Subaru in the U.S. you could get with a turbo and a manual. Every Subaru, yeah. Legacy, like again, I, I learned to drive stick on a Legacy GT wagon. You could get you could get the sedan, you could get the wagon, you could get the uh, the Outback with a turbo and a manual, the Forester, wow. you Holy know, the crap. WRX, the STI, and the Baja. And I will say, I mean, CVTs in a lot of 
applications are like the bane of everybody's existence because they're they're meaty and they drive like crap. Um, but Subaru has actually done an admirable job of making CVTs not just livable, but like actually kind of good, you know, especially in the Outback. It's like a totally, totally good transmission. Nobody who doesn't know what a CVT is would ever think that it's anything different from a normal automatic gearbox. Um, but bring back manuals. Let's, let's do a manual <laughs> wilderness, you know, that would be awesome. It's hilarious. I have to say that. I'm like I'm contractually obligated to say that. You're getting that paid? Contractu- contractually obligated to our imaginary contract because we have no contract and we don't get paid. My old, <laughs> my old man contract says I have to say um, stay with the automatic. <laughs> well, I, I will at least say that I, I am a, a manual <laughs> diehard. So uh, yeah, your garage reflects that. Yeah, exactly. Given that no Lotus Elise was ever sold with the manual, as far as I know, or with a with an automatic, an automatic yeah. that was a Freudian slip. Christ, um, yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So you want to end on that? Yeah, on on, <laughs> on that. From you offending the internet. Yeah. From Lotus Elise to uh, Subaru Outback, we've been all over the place today. Sweet. Uh, I'll wrap up the show real fast. So you can rate, review the show, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, any, anywhere you listen to it. We, we'll, we'll take a review if you got it. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, Subaru's social media is Subaru underscore USA on Instagram and Twitter. I didn't dig deep enough on Facebook. I'm sure they're there too. <laughs> Google. If you search for there. Subaru on Facebook, I'm sure they're there. Uh, you can follow the Hooniverse on Twitter, the Real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read what we write on Hooniverse, UTV Driver, ATV Writer, Everyday Driver, and U.S. News and World Report, which I just made edits on something today. So hopefully, all of the places soon. we got our fingers everywhere. And Ross is at No Not Like the One for Friends, and I'm at Overlanding Dad. And we've done it. We've done the show. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Thank you very much. 